Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends. Guys, welcome back to our slash pro revenge. Where in this episode, a boss repeatedly steals lunches and he ends up with a nice surprise. I hope you enjoy the lineup of stories today and don't forget to hit that subscribe button for future tales. In my youth, my profession of choice was serving at a local pub. We had a lot of good times and some great stories, including one where some dude straight blew up our bathroom. Seriously, the guy blows up the entire toilet with explosive powder. Getting back to the story, the scene is a very crowded bar. Two floors, and both have an outside section all packed. I was working downstairs patio, along with a few bar tables inside. After grabbing some drinks from my outside table, I noticed another had sat down in my section. It was five women, all very attractive. I figured, sweet, let's do this, since I'm a dude who likes ladies. At first, they seem really nice, very complimentary, and they were all ordering top shelf. I'm thinking, hmm, this is good, maybe I'll get a good tip out of them. Plus, one of them was hitting on me pretty heavy as well. The night goes on, and I notice one of them wandering around inside for a minute before leaving. I'm thinking, no big deal, I did just drop off their check, so maybe she was out getting some cash. But no, I head outside and all of them are gone, just absolutely nowhere to be seen. They ran up a near $200 bill, and what was inside was a measly $10. Now anyone who works in restaurants in America knows that some employers could be dicks, and they could make you pay out of pocket if this happens to you. My managers were fantastic people though, and pretty much comped most of it. But still, I wasn't gonna let this slide. I go into full-blown detective mode. As noted above, when I noticed one of the girls lingering inside, she briefly had talked to a table. Sitting there was a group of middle-aged people who were so amazing that I'd love to give them a big hug if possible. I told them the story and they actually offered to pay the bill. But not before one of the women noted that she actually had a short conversation with one of the fine dine and dashers. I'm thinking, oh yes, we've got a lead. I was informed that they were heading to the local club. Maybe I should have figured that, since they did seem to be the type and there's only one in town, but whatever. I did decline their offer to pay it off, as I would be getting what's mine from the culprits, not some great people. So, the revenge. I then told my manager what happened, what information I gained, and what was about to be done. I then grab a food runner named Bill, and we were off to the races. We walk over to the bar and explain the situation to the doorman. We told him we worked at the restaurant down the street and that we suspect there might be five girls in here who dined in Dash on a pretty expensive tap. The dude was so stoked on helping. He in turn takes us upstairs to the bouncers. The bouncers look at me and one of them says with a booming voice, Hey, all you gotta do is point them out. We have no tolerance for that kind of behavior. Now, can I just take a minute to express the pure joy and adrenaline that pump through my veins? When I walked through those doors, walked around for a bit, and saw the whole group of women dancing together, picture Leonidas stoutly raising his arms, pointing to the offenders, and confidently saying, there they are. That's how I felt. It was glorious. The women turned with a look of absolute horror before trying to walk away. The bouncers were majestic lions, where the drunk ladies were gazelles who maybe spent a little too much time at the watering hole. What followed was an epic walk of shame. The women were ferried down two floors, while people who didn't even know what happened gawked and cheered when they saw five pretty women getting walked outside by bouncers. Upon heading outside, there happened to be a few police officers patrolling the streets. So I explained the situation, but mentioned that I don't want to press charges as long as they pay. So while being detained, one of them hands me her credit card, and I walk back to the restaurant triumphantly. It's done. I've won. When I walked back, I guess word had spread, and I actually got an ovation after I hefted the credit card over my head. It was a top moment, I was on cloud 9 for a week after that. Anyway, I actually want to include a short follow up. I was scheduled the next day to work, and who do I see but one of the women. She immediately apologizes, and apparently they're all co-workers. Whenever they go out, they take turns handling the bill. She told me that she was under the impression that it was taken care of, and even noted that she was the one who left the $10 even though she was assured that I was tipped very well. She was very apologetic and she was forgiven. I also assured her that she gave me a story for life, and sometimes those can be more valuable than any amount of money. Guys, I absolutely love this story. Having worked in the restaurant industry, I hate Dine and Dashers with a passion. Like, to me, there's nothing worse than racking up a few hundred dollars worth of food and just walking out. And I'm glad they were caught, because a lot of them just get away scot-free. And hey, they need to cut that one friend who pretended to pay the bill. So, UPS smashed a nearly new MacBook that I sent with them. 
I asked them nicely to pay me back for it, and they blamed me, blamed my packaging, saying it was impossible, they damaged it, etc. I was able to prove my packaging was flawless, and get a statement from the Apple shop, and took it to say that damage was caused by being dropped or thrown. I could also prove it worked when I sent it, and they weren't interested, and they messed me about for a few weeks, sending me from pillar to post, even threatening to make me pay interest on customs charges, which I wasn't liable for as the laptop was smashed on arrival, and thus worthless at import. So I took it to small claims, they hired a lawyer who sent me letters saying they contested it, and would go for full fees etc if I lost. So I went for it anyway, I did law stuff in university, so I knew the basics, and I thought my case was pretty clear cut. So I won, I won my cost back, plus extra, plus interest. They ignored the court order and didn't pay. Now, this laptop was originally being sent to my beloved mother-in-law. She asked me to help with the problem, as UPS were also seriously harassing her for custom fees. However, very unexpectedly, before I could resolve it, she passed away. It was the last thing she ever asked me to do for her, and I love that woman more than pretty much any human on this planet. She was my mother, my best friend, and my mentor. Taking down UPS was now my personal vendetta. So I researched my options. Now I could have taken the usual, more conservative legal routes to reclaim my money, but no, F them, I don't care about the money anymore. I want revenge, I want drama, I want karmic justice. So I went to the high court, I got rid of control, and I of course added on more fees and more interest. I then hired the most aggressive bailiff firm in London. I trusted that the processes and the attitude of UPS would mean they would ignore the letters and actually get a visit. And they did. The bailiffs rock up to UPS headquarters, explain the situation, and UPS refused to pay, so bailiffs start listing goods. Security tried to make them leave, and the office manager tries to bully them out. Now obviously no cares in the world are given by the bailiffs, and they crack on with their jobs. I wasn't allowed the body cam footage, but they did send me a detailed report. The final conclusion is copied from it below. They told me calls were then made to the accounts manager, who arrived in a hurry. As no payment was forthcoming from them, the agent again explained the removal process and the cost involved, and called the office for approval to begin removals. The agent then began to seize assets. The finance director then arrived on scene, and he wasn't happy at all about the attendance, but ultimately agreed to pay the voluntary payment in full from his personal account, in order to stop the removal. Now, I know it's a drop in the ocean to UPS, but I got more than double what I originally asked for to replace the laptop. They would have had to pay even more on top in fees to the bailiffs. I reckon it cost them at least three times more than the original claim in the end. But mostly, I just enjoy the mental image of the flustered finance director and his rage, having to pay his own money to stop the heavies from taking desktop computers and fancy pot plants and things out of their swanky head office lobby. And you know what they say guys, love will make you do crazy things. And in this case, the little guy seizing assets from a big corporation is the ultimate power move. Absolutely brilliant. Okay, so first, some context. Now there's this product called Pure Cap, which is basically 100% capsaicin oil. The stuff that makes hot peppers hot. It has a Scoville rating of 500,000 units per drop, but no flavor, making it ideal for spicing up food without affecting the way it tastes. Putting enough of it, usually only a few drops on any food, can make it almost completely inedible to anybody who's not a total fire mouth. It's available on Amazon for about $30 per 2 ounces, but a little goes a very long way. That's why it's sold in an eyedropper bottle. Now here's the good part. So in the early 2000s, my brother Rick was working in a call center. He didn't take his own lunch often, but every time he did, it would get stolen. Now the first couple of times, he didn't mention it. You know, just in case it was a simple mistake and the person was too embarrassed to own up. However, the third time, he remembered the military axiom. Once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, but thrice is enemy action. So he reports the theft to his boss, Don, and the head of human resources, Dolly. However, they said without proof, there's nothing they could do. No cameras in the break room, and this is where my plan hatched. One night, I made a roast beef dinner with potatoes and carrots, cooked all day in a crock pot with onion soup mix on top. Believe me, it was fork tender and delicious. I also made a nice salad to go with it, and put away a complete dinner serving for him to have for his lunch. The next night, he comes home and said his lunch had been stolen again. 
So the next morning, I made a really deluxe roast beef sandwich with lettuce, pickles, cheddar, and mayo on an 8-inch roll. So whoever was stealing would think they hit the jackpot two days in a row. I also loaded the roast with pure cap, about 30 to 40 drops on the meat alone, and made sure it was all completely absorbed before closing the sandwich, so the roast looks really juicy. I even mixed some into the mayo and put some more onto the bread because bread tends to downplay the fire a bit. Rick comes in about halfway through the pure cap application and he asked what the heck I was doing. I then looked back with an evil grin and said, oh, I'm just making a little present for your lunch thief. My grin was instantly copied on his face. He then went to finish getting ready for work and I could hear him chuckling the whole time. When Rick got home that night, his grin was even bigger as he related the events. He was between calls only a couple of hours into a shift, when suddenly, there's a god-awful howling from the break room. Everyone who wasn't on call right then and there, including Dolly, rushed in to see the sandwich on the table with one bite taken out of it, the half-chewed bite laying right next to it, and Don was at the sink, desperately trying to wash the capsaicin inferno out of his mouth, not knowing that water makes it worse. Don then immediately points at Rick and says, He tried to kill me! then went back to trying to put out the fire in his mouth. With water. Dolly then picked up the bag that the sandwich had been in, which clearly had Rick's name in big red letters on it. Rick looked back with a complete straight face and he shrugged, so Dolly then grabs the guy by the arm and drags him into her office, with him streaming tears and snot the whole way. By this time, the water had sent the pier cap into real overdrive. And Don just had to stand there and burn while Dolly and the call center's manager, Bill, dressed him down for about 15 minutes, finally ending it with his termination for repeated theft. The guy could hardly even speak from the burning, tears, and runny nose that the sandwich caused. And besides, he had no real defense anyway because he just outed himself for stealing an employee's lunch. The company had a zero-tolerance policy for theft of any sort, especially when higher-ups steal from people they manage. So Rick was back at his station and on a call when Bill personally comes over smiling and said Dolly wants to see him when he's free. Here's how he described the encounter. So Rick says, you wanted to see me, ma'am? Dolly responds, yes, I do. First off, you're not in trouble. Second, what the heck did you put in that sandwich? Rick says to her, actually, my brother made it. He then pulls out the bottle of pure cap out of his pocket and sets it on Dolly's desk with a smile. He then tells her, There was kind of really a lot in that meat, and the mayo, and the bread, and Dolly couldn't stop giggling. She told Rick that since Don was now gone, that he was actually next in line for promotion. Rick still says that was the most emotionally satisfying sub he's ever had. He ends up declining that promotion though, so they promoted a different person from that section. A really nice lady named Carrie, who also witnessed the sandwich debacle. The whole office laughed about it for weeks afterwards, and every new hire for the next year got to hear the story, as both entertainment and a warning. I smiled about it for a month, and both Rick and I rarely miss a chance to tell people about Pure Cap and its potential applications regarding lunch thievery. Now, I never did hear anything else about Don, but I imagine getting hired anywhere else, not to mention being promoted to a managerial position, might have been fairly difficult with that huge red flag for theft on his record. Guys, I will never understand why some people just love eating other people's lunches. Like, you're not allowed to eat food that's not yours, and then accuse others of trying to murder you, sir. That's not how it works. On this day, I was walking home after staying at work really late. Walking through the bar scene, I saw a cab, and I was tired, so I decided to take it home. The first time I'd ever decided to do so. It was a short, aggressive ride where the guy's tailgating, honking, swearing, and he's super aggressive. So the fare ends up coming out to $6.40. I give him a 20 and ask for $12 back. The cabbie gives me a $10 from his giant wad of money and says, sorry, he doesn't have any ones. The dude clearly thinks I'm drunk, because he picked me up outside a bar, and he thinks he deserves a better tip, even though the ride was like 3 minutes. I say to him, what do you mean you don't have any ones? You're a cabbie, I just saw your giant wad of cash. He persists, so I say no, you're driving me down the street to that pizza shop and we're getting change. The guy says no he won't. When I ask, he refuses to give me his name, and then he gives me a menacing get the f out of my cab look. Like he's gonna punch me in the face. The dude's definitely a tough guy, and he's pretty scary. 
Think short, stocky henchman type with buzz silver hair and a leather jacket. So I leave, not before catching his cab number as he speeds off. Okay, so it's the principle of the matter. The guy's doing this to drunk kids all night, and probably making a lot of money by intimidating and victimizing these customers, and I won't stand for that. I call the cab company and I get my full $10 back, but it takes a bunch of harassment and several months to finally get it. I call the cab company's director, who couldn't care less, and flat out told me that he believed the cabbie's story over mine. So not only is this happening, it's being enabled, and the complaints aren't being registered. I tell him that if he doesn't take any course of action whatsoever, then I'd be forced to take it up with the city's transportation oversight commission, that oversees this stuff. The guy basically dares me to do so. So I enter this ridiculously arduous process, where after reading up on the local laws, I write a major complaint to the public commission, and request they be fined under certain articles. A couple of months later, I get a response letter. Cab company hires this sleazy lawyer who claims that I'm lying about everything, and had this malicious intent. He claims that I demanded ones, and the cabbie didn't immediately procure them, but then did seconds later. And at that point, I was fuming mad that I wanted to exact revenge. He calls my character credibility into question completely. The letter was so amateur and there were so many transparent lies in it that it was both laughable and sad. So I go to my preliminary hearing, which I took to mean like it was just filing out paperwork, or at most a private deposition or something. But no, everyone's there, including the cabbie, the beregled secretary who sent my refund, the cab company's director, the sleazy lawyer, a court reporter, and a judge ridiculous cheap suits all around for the cab entourage. The in-person sleaziness of the lawyer did not disappoint. Think bad pinstripe suit, pink tie, slick back hair, and a pencil mustache, all resting on a sweaty and anxious fat man whose only apparent mode in trial is a combination of snideness and faux suspicion. The cabbie's giving me threatening looks the whole time, and frankly, I'm a little scared that he's gonna kick my ass afterwards. As a bonus, the judge is a relatively young, extremely polite, thoughtful, level-headed, and patient person. So we give our stories. Cabby gives this really terribly acted story of how I tried to intimidate him into getting more ones, how I became furious, etc, etc. But the guy can't keep his facts together, and he keeps stumbling over his obviously rehearsed lines. The sleazy lawyer tries to poke holes in my very simple and coherent story like it's a Hardy Boys novel. It's the cheesiest thing you guys have ever seen. Meanwhile, I'm trying to cross-examine him while basically learning on the job how to be a hack lawyer at this crappy municipal hearing, and I even take a few jabs at the cabbie for lying on the stand that were met with various objections. Now, you could cut the tension between me and this cabbie with a knife, and I made a lot of awkward mistakes because of that, but overall, it went pretty well. The judge makes a ruling a few months later, noting that the cabbie was clearly not credible, and orders the cab company to pay a $1,500 civil penalty to the city for various infractions, such as fraud, not providing reasonable service, and not identifying himself. I think, sweet. But then months later, a lawyer issues an exception to this ruling, which I didn't know could occur. At around 9pm the night it's due, the exception brings up all these reasons that they shouldn't be fined, and also attacks my credibility once again regarding the details of the story, basically threatening to undo the ruling if I didn't respond. I get a notice of this filing via email and frantically write up an official response to exceptions, which was required to address these issues, and I submit it just under midnight. Months later, I think a total of one and a half years since the incident, the judge examines the new material and rules that the $1,500 fine stands. To think all of this happened over $2, guys. I really commend OP for taking a stand against this shady cab company, where a lot of people would have just let the measly $2 go. But like OP said, it's principle. And I really wonder if they learned their lesson, though. And that, my friends, brings us to another end of our slash pro revenge. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the stories in this episode. If you did, do hit that thumbs up. And if you missed the last episode on the channel, I'll link it right here. A super entitled Karen refuses to go to jail because she has things to do. She literally tells the cop that, so go check it out if you haven't. And myself and Stevie Boy will see you guys in the next one. We love you.